So I want to discuss a case here that I've been working on for a couple of years and use this as a vehicle to identify and really specifically uh, address some of the more uh, difficult and challenging concepts in litigation for lawyers, uh, for litigants and citizens alike. One of the most frustrating things that citizens express about dealing with lawyers in the judicial system is how much uh, litigation costs and uh, how long it takes. And so oftentimes, even if you get a case where you knock it out of the park, get a home run, uh, the citizen, the litigant still isn't satisfied and quite frankly, justifiably so because uh, in order to get that quote success, uh, they've had to spend tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars and it's taken years of their lives and so I certainly understand where a litigant would look at you and, and it's happened to me and say, you know, you tell me I won, but gee whiz, this is the worst feeling win that I can ever think of. And that happens in litigation and it happens in litigation uh, for a variety of reasons. I think our rules are set up basically to provide some kind of fairness. But one of the things that we experience right now and it's really bad, has been awful for years, is the amount of time that it takes to bring a case to resolution. Uh, trying to get a typical hearing in front of a judge can be you know, six months, three months out, and that's even before this COVID crash stuff, where we're all expecting it's gonna take a year before you get some kind of real hearings, and it's just gonna take years before you get a uh, real resolution in cases. Uh, this exists, this problem, uh, largely because the state of Florida, as in many states, but it's particularly acute in Florida, uh, Republican policymakers have decided that the judicial system doesn't matter. And um, while we think of the judicial system as one stool of a three-legged stool, judicial, executive, legislative branch, the fact of the matter is that, um, and I'll continue to harp on Republican policymakers because they've been in control of the state for decades, but what they've done is they've decided to just defund the court system. So um, a lot of critiques, criticisms, judges, lawyers, the court system, and much of this is because the legislature and the executive branch have decided that the citizens of this state uh, are not entitled to a properly functioning judicial system. And um, I think it's largely about to corporate interests because they're in many ways beneficiaries of this. But more importantly, you just have this philosophical uh, uh, theory that we just won't pay for a court system. We don't want citizens to have access to a high quality, properly functioning judicial system. And so the way we'll do that is we won't pay judges, we won't pay clerks, we won't pay staff. And so if you wanna try and get a resolution in your case, you're looking for months out for getting any kind of hearing. So. Uh, this, the second thing is the cost that's involved in that. Um, you know, lawyers, we got to pay salaries and bills and uh, filing fees, the office, all these kind of things, and it costs money. So uh, delay in litigation proceedings and the inability to get things decided quickly pushes costs along to consumers. And so there's a lot of dissatisfaction among consumers about the legal system, uh, and I frankly understand. I agree with much of that. Uh, hopefully, in this video, one of the things I really want to address is some way that we can kind of respond to that as litigants and maybe empower our clients to try and uh, balance out the equities a little bit by talking about fee shifting in cases where it may not seem that that option is available. What I want to do is uh, first share a screen here um, that will lay out the docket for you a little bit. I think that's really helpful. So this is the case uh, where... Harsha Mystery, a real estate investor in St. Petersburg, Florida, sues my client, David Orloff, and Phyllis Mitten there. And what I always like to do when I do one of these things is start at the beginning. You see uh, how far uh, along this case has been, uh, how long it's been litigated. You got a docket that just goes on and on and on, and that's terribly frustrating. You see, this begins May 2019 when Mystery files a suit. Uh, and the thing that is very frustrating about this is that uh, this shows just really aggressive litigation, discovery and amended complaints, and motions to dismiss, and this, this plaintiff just going on and on and on, uh, and not giving up and really putting the defendants through their paces. Um, on the one side of the plaintiff, we got, as he says in his, tes his testimony deposition, a sophisticated real estate investor. Uh, and on the other side, you've got my client, uh, and the other defendant who are these uh, elderly folks that just don't have much assets at all, um, but they're being forced to litigate a case uh, against somebody uh, that's going at them pretty hard. Now, in short, what this case is all about is uh, a property. And uh, my clients uh, own a piece of property uh, that, that he wants. And so what he does is he sues, uh, well, first of all, the, the property goes out into the MLS, multiple listing service, and uh, it gets under contract. 
what this entire litigation that's been going on for years now uh, is about is this sentence right here. Um, the, the seller, the defendants, put into this uh, contract uh, this term. The purchase is contingent upon co-owner agreeing to price the terms. Now, I, I don't know how anybody in this world interprets this other than exactly what it says. We go under contract, but what we're saying here is, hey, we need to make sure that the other guy, that'd be my client, agrees to this before we can sell it. Plain language, plain and simple. In the litigation, uh, the plaintiff takes this bizarre position, and frankly, uh, at, at the end of this, I find that it's just absolutely bad faith, but you see Mystery sues uh, Minton and my client and claims that, that, that uh, our position in there, this contract is contingent on co-owner approval, means Phyllis Minton individually and Phyllis Minton Trust. It's an it's a absurd position from the beginning. And as we'll lay out in the litigation, uh, I think it's bad faith because it was clear absolutely from the beginning that Phyllis Minton, when she put that provision in the contract, was saying to Mystery, hey, I can't sell this property to you uh, until I get uh, the other party to sign off on this. So he files this thing 2019. And um, we, the other side, one of the other defendants here comes along and files. It's a really great motion to dismiss. And it lays it out and says, black and white judge, there is a condition in here. There is this uh, co-owner approval thing and it wasn't met. And because of that, they shouldn't even be allowed to proceed with this contract. Well, the standard on motion to dismiss is really high. And of course that's not great. So um, litigation ensues. And, one of the most important things that I want to address here in this litigation, well, let's let's get to the end of it. So uh, this thing starts in 2019, and at the end of the day, Judge Williams, uh, March 2020, just slams the plaintiff with a summary judgment. You lawyers know that what summary judgment means is it's not even a question of material fact. This thing is so black and white. I don't need a trial. I don't need a jury. I don't need any of this stuff. It's the judge to say in plaintiff. You shouldn't have filed this thing. Uh, it's, it's, I heard all I need to hear, and you're wrong. Get out of here. Well, they don't give up. They keep filing stuff over and over and over again. And again, getting back to the docket in, in this issue of attorney's fees, what I want to show you is um, page counts. And really, when we look at abusive litigation and the cost to litigants, you focus on page counts. And over and over and over again, you see this plaintiff just filing hundreds and hundreds of pages and we're filing stuff as well in response. But all this case is, uh, illustrates is the cost of litigation and all this backs up. Clients get bills for thousands of dollars, but it's because we've got all this uh, pleadings and all these things are going on. But anyway, at the end of the day, what happens is the judge says, no, you're not entitled to this property and I'm going to find you and hold you liable. And this is the final judgment that she enters. That's not enough. Uh, the plaintiff just keeps going on and on and on. They won't accept what the judge has entered. And so they timely file this rehearing. And as I say in my responses, it's overwrought. What does overwrought mean? It means you just won't leave well enough alone. And one of the concepts in, in rehearing is um, you, you don't get to re-argue what happened at trial. Uh, the judge, when she hears a case, makes a decision based on what she hears. And the point in litigation, in rehearing, is to alert the court to a, a, an error that she made uh, in either the law or the fact, not to try and re-argue again. But what we see here, like we've seen throughout all this litigation, is 23 pages worth of over and over and over again, all this nonsense, footnotes, and, and, and a completely overwrought argument that, again, only serves the purpose of, of uh, further inflaming litigation rather than just accepting a result and moving on and, hey, Parties are entitled to appeal, but I think that that should always be in good faith and it should be appealed and it should be in consideration of um, all of the parties involved and, and really the facts of the case. All right, so after years of litigating this thing, you finally go, this has just gotten out of control. And one of the things that is a, is a blatant black and white illustration of a litigant just gone out of control is what happens here, frankly, to my wife. I'm sitting here at my house uh, I, I, was, I was at home and I get a frantic call from my wife to find out that lo and behold, uh, the plaintiff had sent a process server to my door with my wife and two young children here to subpoena my wife 
to come to a, a hearing for which she wasn't even appropriate, wasn't an evidentiary hearing. And, and so this plaintiff decides what they would do. Uh, I quite frankly think just an issue of the in, in, in intimidation, attempted intimidation. They send a pro process server here to my house. It's just absurd. So I filed this motion immediately and, you know, screaming at the judge. You know, judge, why would the plaintiff's lawyer send a process server to my house to uh, try and harass my wife? I'm talking to this lawyer every day. We're back and forth on the email. And if you want her, set it up. You want to take my wife's deposition for whatever purpose? Fine. Send an email, set it up. Maybe we'll have a court uh, have a hearing on it or whatever. But frank, frankly, I would have uh, agreed to a hearing. So to just send a, a process server to my house, I think only is more indication of the bad faith that exists throughout this litigation. Anyway, so this sort of sets the stage for this uh, overwrought litigation and where we start looking at this and going, you know, we got to start pushing some of this liability for fees back onto this plaintiff mystery for all the conduct that they're engaging in. And we really start digging into the different theories of fee shifting and there's some interesting ones in here that are really important to focus on. First of all, um, obviously, we all know that under admissions, um, you, you got to get admissions out to a party. And if they don't answer them correctly, um, they can be pushed to have legal fees uh, uh, pushed back onto them. And this one is just real black and white, the admission is. Um, who do you think is the co-owner on here? And that was one of the admissions that we gave. And the plaintiff responds, well, gee whiz, I don't know, and some evasive answer. What, it, it, what we find out later is that um, it's been clear to the plaintiff from the very beginning that um, my client was the co-owner and that this whole theory of proceeding this case really was in bad faith. And so that's where uh, the first motion for sanctions, well, the first one was regarding the, the, uh, the, the subpoena, but admissions is where we get into this. Hey, mystery knew at the front end that uh, you shouldn't have uh, pursued this based on this theory. And so we want to push attorneys fees in here. Another really important one in dealing with real estate litigation is uh, Liz Pendens. Pay careful attention to 48.23. Uh, if, if a party files a Liz Pendens and it turns out later that that Liz Pendens was ill-served uh, or ill-advised, you have the ability to push liability for attorney's fees back onto uh, the party that falsely recorded that lien. And that's a, a real problem. People, lawyers, have gotten real sloppy with just out there filing Liz Pendens. And uh, what all the case law tells us is you got to be careful of that uh, because understand what a Liz Pendens does. You file a Liz Pendens and that just locks up a person's property and uh, the consequences, the damages that flow from that can be very extreme. So in this motion here, uh, we've got all the case law dealing with this. And basically it's, it's just a warning. Be very careful before you file a Liz Pendens. You got to make sure that you got a proper basis for filing it. If not, you're going to find yourself liable both for, the lawyers and attorneys fees for getting that list pendants removed. And then importantly, for the damages that are associated with, uh, with filing that. So Liz pendants in here, um, again, another detailed explanation of why liability for attorney's fees should be pushed over to the plaintiff because a Liz pendants is a temporary injunction. And when you refuse to remove that Liz pendants, even when you know that it's improper, uh, you should be held liable for that. And we get into all the damages here that we suffer because, because of this litigation that, again, ultimately resolved in our favor. Sky maintains mystery of Liz pendants, and it doesn't get resolved. Back to what, what I say is overwrought. You know, uh, the, the plaintiff, uh, when, the, when the court finds against them in rehearing or in judgment, they go through 23 pages of banging over the same argument over and over again that the court has already rejected. Um, they got 23 pages, you know, I don't know whether that's 250 a page or $400 a page, but the point is that litigation is expensive uh, and legal fees start to add up because of the research involved. I try to keep stuff brief. I think as a responsible litigant, particularly when you're dealing with consumers, you know, if you can say in four pages uh, what somebody else is, is doing in, 40, in 23 pages, you got to do your four pages and just hope that the judge gets the issue behind the um, uh, brevity. Uh, it, it worked for us. The court really quickly uh, stomped on it and gave uh, us, us a denial of the rehearing. Now I want to talk about uh, really one of the more interesting things here that exposed something that I think is really important. Again, is, is we're getting hammered by this plaintiff mystery on this case over and over again. 
we have to start looking at, hold on a second, it's costing these poor elderly people hundreds of thousands of dollars of attorney's fees, and we gotta figure out a way to shift liability back onto this plaintiff so that there's some consequence for him engaging in this conduct. Well, we all know that uh, 571057 is one uh, way to do that. It's frankly the most common way, the 1057 component. Um, and really what that uh, requires you to do is to send a letter to the litigant, uh, their attorney, uh, that you allege is engaging in improper conduct, uh, bad faith litigation, essentially, or making allegations or claims that are unsupported by the facts, and they have a, a period to remove those. If, they, if, you, if you get this letter and you look at the case, you look at the facts, you got to sit down with your client, you got to say, you know, Jim, I, I got this letter, 57105. It puts some real serious liability on both of us. We need to think about this. And that's a big warning sign, 571057. Um, and, but if you choose to go forward, even after getting the warning and the 21-day period has passed, um, then that's when you really uh, find yourself subject to liability for attorney's fees. Um, the other litigant sends out the, the safe harbor letter. These people, mystery stubbornly pursues the case. And here we find ourselves with them finding, uh, they are filing their motion for attorney's fees under 571057. Again, we all know that we're sort of rehashing what was commonly known, but 571051 is another avenue for relief that's much less uh, widely used, but I think finds uh, it should be used much more frequently. Look at what 571051 uh, provides. It says that upon the court's initiative or motion of any party, the court shall award a reasonable attorney's fees for the other party engaging in a claim or defense uh, with the court finds that the losing party's attorney knew or should have known that the claim or defense was not supported by the facts. You know, 571051 is the same standard as 571057. Seven has a safe harbor. One doesn't have it. So in a case like this, uh, or let, let's say another case, um, you're litigating a case back and forth, back and forth, and it's just not clear that there's bad faith about it. But then years into this litigation, after your party has uh, absorbed hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees, let's say that one of the witnesses that was formerly aligned with the uh, other party um, recants and says, you know what, this guy knew from the beginning that he didn't have a cause of action, but what he decided he was gonna do was he was gonna litigate the heck out of this thing and see whether there wasn't some way he could force uh, through uh, the litigation process, uh, your party to bow into submission and win. That'd be an example of where uh, 571057 Safe Harbor wouldn't have been available to you at the front end because you didn't know that way back when. But fast forward all the way to the end of the litigation, you have this aha moment. You have this witness that goes, man, he never should have filed this thing. We talked about this. And, he said, I don't care, I'm gonna sue him. You know, we got more money, we're gonna go after these people and we'll just beat them into submission and we'll use the court to extract out of them uh, what, what we need. Again, that's what 571051 says, is that uh, at any point in time, when you discover that it was inequitable, it was improper for your party to be sued, uh, that's when you need to be build, bring the 571005 motion. Think about it in a courtroom. Uh, you, you, a judge starts getting uh, uh, concerned that, that you're, the other party is being abusive. Um, and you need to give that judge some vehicle to hold them accountable. Um, 571051 is that vehicle to do so. And you know, it, judges don't know everything. Um, and so sometimes having this ready right then and there, you know, when you know a judge is, is really hacked off, the other side is uh, doing something that's improper, they're, they're engaging in discovery, misconduct, or you know, just engaging in bad faith. That's your time to pop right up and say, Judge, I appreciate your comments. I appreciate that you're upset by this. If you are, you got a vehicle here to shift some liability to this litigant. 57105 allows you right now to, to tag them with attorney's fees. You catch a judge in the right position and, and you'll get them to agree with you on here. Um, 57, my other uh, litigant here has done a real nice job in this, this nice memo here of laying out some of the case law on 571057. And here we've got everything on 571051. Uh, and again, this has all the pleadings. Now, be careful with 571057 in particular because there's some very specific um, rules, technical rules on safe harbor, and you got to be careful uh, that you go uh, you pay attention to that. I want to uh, illustrate another uh, concept here, and that is 
the conduct or the concept of inequitable conduct. Um, you know, again, typically only attorney's fees shifting occurs when there's a statute or there's a contract involved, but there's also case law um, that provides that uh, under this concept of inequitable conduct, uh, you can uh, shift the burden to the other side um, by uh, pushing this litigation over to them, illustrating to the court that the conduct was uh, inequitable from the beginning. Here, I've highlighted here, uh, attorney's fees under 57105 is mandatory if an action is unsupported by the material fact at the time the claim arose. And we go through all that case all right there. And I think that's really important. And one of the other things I like to do in, in this new age of digital, you know, early on what we would do with the contract is we would have our pleading and we'd have our exhibits A, B, C, D, and they're attached to the back. But what's happening now? Um, I learned this actually from an appellate court judge that, you know, it used to be they'd get big boxes of cases and they have the binders there. They'd sit at a desk and they'd read uh, the appellate memorandum and then they'd flip back and grab the exhibit. Well, now the appellate court judges have the uh, entire briefing on their tablet, uh, Apple iPad. And if you're trying to flip from a you know, 50 page brief and go back to the exhibit to see exactly what's going on here, it's very difficult. So one of the things you can do uh, and should do, quite frankly, is use the SNP function on your computer. If you don't know what the SNP function is, uh, look down into the bottom left-hand corner over here. I wonder if I could bring it up. Um, here it is right here, snipping tool. And what snipping tool allows you to do is take a little snapshot of that piece that you want right there. And then uh, that's saved onto the copy board. And then... Uh, then you just drop that back into the case anyway. So what we do on an exhibit is you snip out the provision of the contract that you want the court to focus on in that particular paragraph, and then you drop it right there. It allows the court to read it real easily, not lose the train of thought, compare back and forth to what I just said in, in this paragraph here to exactly what the relevant point of the contract is and be able to see it black and white in front of the judge's own eyes. Same thing right here. You know, again, we don't force the judge to flip back and forth with the contract. It's all sitting right there. And laying out the story, uh, again, what we've done in this particular case, and, and where I assert in all these pleadings that this gets into bad faith, is judge, you can't just look at the contract. Uh, contract's important, but what we discovered in litigation, Your Honor, are these emails that show that before these parties entered into this contract, they really knew who the other party was. And I think putting these documents right in front of a judge, not in a way that they got to have the complaint here, and this exhibit, this exhibit, this exhibit, this exhibit, but rather using that SNP function to cut out the relevant portion of the document and drop it right there in front of them, uh, I think is a really important uh, litigation strategy and something that's very helpful in a case. So in this particular case, and I'm, I'm wrapping this up here, what, what we've done in addition to the 57105 and inequitable conduct and admissions and uh, Liz Pendens is laid out multiple theories uh, for the court to shift liability for attorney's fees onto a party that we think the evidence is absolutely clear should not have been pursuing this case from the very beginning, but instead chose to do so. So here we sit at the end of litigation. We got a final judgment. They did rehearing page after page after page. Uh, they're probably going to appeal. So this, all I'm doing here is sort of a, a predicate, a, a preamble to the oral argument. And what we say is we want the court to uh, pay attention to all the documents. And again, the, the lesson here is a couple things. Number one, litigation is expensive. It's frustrating for parties. What can we do as lawyers to respond to our clients' really reasonable concerns about cost of litigation and how long it takes? Um, and then secondarily, making sure that in all cases, we try to find a way to hold wrongdoing parties accountable by pushing liability for attorney's fees onto them and alerting the court to uh, your case and making it clear uh, from the beginning and throughout the case of the liability for attorney's fees. So, you know, expect that this case is gonna wind up in appellate court uh, and that this is just sort of a preamble or a beginning to that. But what I wanna do is drop that docket in there so that you as a practitioner or a pro se litigant can go and find all those documents, read through all those pleadings. It's got all the case law right in there, but I think it's just a real good resource uh, for all parties to, to, to understand shifting liability for attorney's fees uh, in this particular case, a, a litigation uh, in real property.